had absolutely no idea when we started out on this that we could attempt to win the world record. That certainly was not part of my thinking to begin with. After we got an engine up and running, seeing it on the test bed, uh, I thought, well, I wonder if we could do more with this and just have it, have it in a 20 mile an hour JCB. JCB has always had a passion for engineering excellence and innovation. In 2005, JCB began production of its own engines in a brand new state-of-the-art facility. The JCB 444 engine is fitted in a range of JCB machines, including the world-famous backhoe loader. Now, JCB have taken two of these engines, dramatically increased their power and engineered them into a four-wheel drive vehicle for a world land speed record attempt. The gearbox train, again, uh, is something that uh, has come from our excellent transmission plant. It is an ultimate test. It's doing it under uh, pretty high pressures. It is doing it with sort of iced water flowing through its veins. I'm very excited about the project. I think it's a natural extension of what we did in developing our own engine. JCB has brought together a team of experienced engineers and experts, including the former land speed record holder, Richard Noble. This is the world famous Relton Mobile Special, one of the greatest of the land speed record cars of all time. And this actually was the uh, inspiration really for the JCB car. What we're after here is the FIA record, and it's a wheel-driven record for a, the diesel class of car. It's the ultimate diesel class of car, and um, we've got to do two passes over the measured mile within a period of one hour. So, the challenge is a world land speed record with a JCB-designed vehicle, wheel-driven, and powered by two JCB diesel engines. 1,500 horsepower delivered through four-wheel drive. A superbly efficient transmission capable of feeding 12 times the power of a standard JCB engine through to the ground. An exceptionally strong chassis to protect the driver and to withstand the enormous forces generated by the engines. The JCB world record attempt needs an outstanding driver. The person chosen, the fastest man on earth and holder of the current land speed record. Andy Green. It's fantastically exciting to be part of this uh, JCB-led team taking what are industrial power plants um, and elements of JCB drivetrains, putting them into this incredible car. Everything has to be right on the day and I have to pull all that together in the cockpit. Ultimately, fantastic team of guys has built this brilliant car. I've got a track there, I have to apply one to the other exactly right to get the result that um, all that hard work deserves. Even the running conditions are extreme highly corrosive salt, an irregular track surface, high altitude, and over 100 degrees of blistering heat. Such an extreme environment requires an exceptional vehicle, a JCB machine with a lightweight, high-technology steel space frame, a protective carbon fiber cockpit, two engines, two transmission systems, twin two-stage turbochargers, twin intercoolers, optimized air and exhaust flow, state-of-the-art suspension, ice cooling, parachute braking, wheel braking system, high-speed wheels and tires, and an aerodynamically efficient body shell. This is a very exciting project. I think there is no better way of showcasing both the engine and what it does, but also showing our engineering ability, showing that we can innovate. Uh, I think it would be a thrill for everybody.
JCB are tackling a project like this because we started to manufacture our own diesel engines at the end of 2004. And that was a big step for the company. It's a new startup business for us. And we wanted to promote the engine uh, in an exciting way. And it's a, it's a very capable engine. It has very high performance. It's a modern technology engine. And this is a really great way to, uh, to demonstrate what its potential is. I checked when we were developing this engine at Ricardo. And I got uh, one of the archivists there to check what the, the record was, and it was 235, I think it was, as a record. And I thought, well, maybe we could have a crack at that. Now, it was before we developed the engine. And I had absolutely no idea, and I don't think anybody else had, that we would eventually get out of this 80 to 100 horsepower engine, that we'd get 750 horsepower out of it. And uh, I had no idea that we could do that, and I put it at the back of my mind until um, not, not long after we launched the engine. And I talked to, to Tim Leverton about it and said, I think we should have a crack. And that, that's what, how it happened. I got a message saying, um, would I make contact with Mr. Bamford? Because he was thinking of doing a record car. And I thought, wow, this is terrific. So I said to him, look, it's very simple. What you've got to do is you've got to produce the fastest ever diesel car in the world. That's what you've got to do. We need two engines because uh, although the record stands at 235 miles an hour, which is relatively slow, uh, already there has been even a truck that's run at Bonneville at 280 miles an hour, a diesel truck. So, you know, we've got to go a lot, lot faster than that. So we can't do it with one, so we're going to have to do two engines. And then if we look at a car, um, a 1936 car called the Relton Mobile Special, which is in Birmingham, um, that, had a, that was a very interesting car, land speed record car, which had uh, two engines, but they weren't linked. So that was where the concept started. Last October, we started the engine development in earnest, uh, building the first engine, uh, which ran in December. And then it's been a very intense development program from January through to July and we, we literally finished the, the performance development of the engines just uh, a couple of weeks before we came here we achieved the target power and the two engines that are in the car today were, were passed off on the Ricardo test beds just literally about 48 hours before we, we came out here. These days the technical uh, input that goes into building uh, the fast track for example which is complex control systems in, in, inside it and this is a great way of JCB demonstrating that outside of their normal environment, really. Um, it certainly shows that they're a company that, that's looking to the future, wants, wants to be seen as, as a, a go-ahead company. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's fantastic to use the brand in that, in that way. I think I'm most proud of the way that we've been able to assemble a team of, of real world-class experts in each field from JCB, from Visioneering and from, uh, from Ricardo and they've come together uh, in, the, in the final stages of the project in the middle of July and worked together as one team. Uh, whatever problem that we've, uh, we've faced and we've had problems every day, we've just got behind wherever that problem is, put the solutions in place and moved on and uh, really facing a lot of pressure running the car in public. Uh, through the Bonneville Speed Week where the car wasn't working properly. Um, the team has just really kept its nerve, kept its uh, focus and uh, delivered the solution. And uh, I'm really proud of that. We've got four or five engine guys, two or three gearbox guys. We've got car or vehicle and suspension guys and bodywork guys. So we've got an engineer and fitters or engineers and mechanics to cover each part of the car and uh, that's the only way we could do it. You cannot send out for someone once you're here. You need to have everything at your fingertips. The project is a, a, an incredible example of what British engineering uh, can do. Um, we do have a strong uh, motorsports um, engineering here, base in the UK, um, and we've been able to tap into that and combine it with our in-house uh, expertise in terms of the engine uh, itself, transmissions and so forth, and I think it's a, a perfect illustration of the strength of British engineering. Well, I got involved in this project uh, at early in uh, 2005 when JCB looked at doing a land speed project and first contemplated it. Of course, they talked to Richard Noble about the organisation and what was achievable. When they actually came around to talking about a driver uh, and where they might find such a creature, uh, Richard said, well, I'm sure Andy would be interested, let's give him a call. 
and I had to think about it for ooh, about two seconds before deciding that I'd love to. There are a lot of, of uh, unique characteristics that the car has. Um, firstly, because it's the only car that has JCB engines in it, it has a, a cross-section and a layout which reflects directly the size and, and shape of the engines lying horizontally in the car. Um, there are other two-engined cars uh, that have been built, but I think the arrangement of our car is, is a unique one. And the second area is the uh, treatment of the aerodynamics, which um, I think is very unique. The higher nose the profile that you see and the channels in between the front wheels and that the, the run out behind the front wheels is really uh, a completely innovative treatment for, um, for cars running on the salt. Uh, and you'll, you won't see any other car um, at Bonneville that has that, or at least not up until now. <laughs> you may well see that uh, imitated in the future. The whole car is, is under enormous uh, stress and strain, so um, you know, it's necessary to inspect everything. We look at all of the brakes, the hubs, the bearings, the steering, suspension joints, all of the safety systems especially um, are checked and uh, as well as you know the, the health of the of the engines and powertrains. The biggest challenges you face in, in creating a car like this is to work out all the different parameters that you need to achieve the speed target which was over 300 miles per hour for us and then to f get what you can from the engines and fit all of that together in an aerodynamic package and a drivable package for the car that allows the full performance of the engine to be realised uh, on the track. I could have used a wind tunnel, but uh, made the conscious decision that computational fluid dynamics would be more accurate for this vehicle. To help the vehicle slow down, we have three braking systems. We have the friction brakes, uh, the carbon friction brakes, we have parachutes, and we have exhaust braking. It's a heavy car, it's going very fast and we need to stop in a controlled manner. So uh, you can't actually put the uh, carbon brakes on at a high speed, otherwise they would get so hot they'd destroy themselves. So they're really for the second or third zone of braking. So as he goes through the flying mile, he'll put out um, a high speed parachute, which will bring the speed down to a point where we can start to apply the carbon brakes. Should the parachute fail, then we can bring in the exhaust, the driver can bring in the exhaust brake, which pulls the speed down in a very gradual way uh, and also contributes to the, to the point at which you can start applying the um, friction brakes. I've uh, been very careful on the design of this to try and deflect the salt crystals away from the vehicle and hopefully it, uh, reduce the uh, total drag, that is the aerodynamic drag plus the drag caused by all of the salt particles. Well, having defined the shape of the vehicle for aerodynamic reasons, the surface is actually made from carbon composites, and this in turn is supported by a steel space frame. Uh, great care in the construction has to be taken that everything is accessible so that rapid turnarounds can be achieved, and when we need to do something big like changing an engine, this can be done without using up too much time. Tyres are certainly one of the limiting factors. Um, we really have to evaluate the tyre performance after each run. We're going to change the tyres um, after each run. And we'll evaluate all the data that we collect from the car. We have about 100 channels um, of data, 100 different sensors on the car. And each time we run the car at a higher speed, then we are going into unknown territory for the, all of the uh, systems on the car. The tyres for this vehicle have always been a challenge to us. Nobody makes a tyre that's specific for, for our use. So we've selected an existing um, land speed record tyre and, and, and built the car around that. In order to be sure that it was up to the job, we've carried out quite an extensive testing and validation process. We've been using a test rig at uh, the Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio happens to be the place where they test the, the space shuttle tyres and uh, we've been through a, a test program which has given us the confidence that that tyre will, will do the job that we need. In conjunction with uh, a, a JCB designer called Mike Turner, um, we've produced a shape which everybody here in Utah are saying is an absolutely beautiful car and that in itself is a sort of great satisfaction.
one of the remarkable things about Bonneville. We've actually got between 11 and 12 miles of perfectly smooth, very hard, um, and reasonably high grip salt. Challenge all, all the time is to control the power very precisely, to accelerate as fast as possible, to deal with the stability as the tyre stability goes down at higher speeds, and as the, before the fin stability comes in at the very high speeds, that sort of 150, 200 miles an hour where it's all happening. And of course, we're only just into third gear at that stage. There's, a, there's the real challenge there of keeping the car in a straight line and keeping it on boost. The Bonneville Salt Flats is about the only venue uh, in the world that you can uh, come to regularly and routinely to run at these sorts of speeds. And that's because it has uh, a surface which is very, very flat. And for a long enough track, uh, 11, 12 miles uh, available to be able to accelerate to get the speed you want through the flying mile. You can see the pictures, you can read about it, but uh, actually being there, the heat and the light is unbelievable. And uh, really the, the atmosphere, the scenery um, is awesome. And I think uh, all of the team have found that same experience. And it's, it's really a special place to be. smooth, uh, the ride is fantastic, it's very precise, the chassis handles very well, the steering works very well, I can feel the salt moving around underneath me, it is of course a natural surface so you can feel the undulations, you know, even feel tiny, bit, tiny little bits of crosswind through the steering wheel, uh, which is exactly what a land speed record car should be, it's a beautifully, beautifully put together car. We've actually done a 308 mile an hour pass today with a, uh, with a final exit speed after five miles of 313. So we're exactly in the bracket with the D-rated engines on the test uh, performance for this car, already to become the world's fastest diesel. And that's before we put the big engines in next week. There's a distinct difference between the way the South California Timing Association or the Bonneville Nationals organise the event and the FIA timing, for instance. The Bonneville National people run in the same direction one day and then the next day, whereas for FIA you have to run out and back of the same mile within an hour, which is the classic record-breaking scenario. The last few weeks have been a classic example of the highs and lows of land speed record-breaking. From arriving at Wittering with a car that wasn't finished and wasn't ready to run and we hadn't even started the engines together, all the way through to finishing the Wittering runs, 22 runs into it, 201 miles an hour achieved and everything working really well. Absolutely fantastic result in a really short space of time. Packed everything, got it here, got it assembled, um, all undamaged, all still in working condition, and then we take it out to the salt for the first day, and the rear engine will not pick up. And we take it out the following day, having worked on it, and the rear engine will not pick up. We've uh, mechanically changed the car, we certainly know what the problem is, we've tested it on the runway, and yet again, the rear engine will not pick up. And at one stage, while we're trying to get the engine to work, I'm down to 27 miles an hour. But it was, it was the, the lowest point ever in my land speed record career, and the low point for the whole team. We just, we could not understand. And then we suddenly found it was a tiny software problem, fixed that, second run that day, both engines pick up together, and the car is suddenly up over 300 miles an hour. We said we had an aspiration to try and do over 300, and we did it at Bonneville. We're in impound, waiting for a return record run. The following morning, it's even faster. We do a 317 two-pass average. We have a Bonneville record for a diesel streamliner, and we are also now the fastest diesel car in the world. Having achieved all of that, of course, we now go into uh, the international week, where we will try and match the Bonneville record with a, an FIA internationally recognized record and hopefully we'll make the car go even faster. How fast? We don't know. There are so many different limitations. We still know very little about the car. It's still only done 101 miles under its own power. It's still only been on the salt five times, so we've got a lot to learn, a lot to do. Hopefully we'll double that amount of mileage next week. We'll know a lot more about it, and we'll get it to go a lot faster. Uh, over the last couple of days since we finished running at uh, SCTA Speed Week, uh, we've done a, a routine engine change 
Uh, the engines have a, a limited life and uh, the engines that have got in now are what we were calling our, our record engines for doing the FAA record next week. So we've changed those over the last two, two and a half days and uh, we've made some small modifications from lessons that we've learnt uh, during Speed Week. Uh, some changes to the uh, oil, front oil tank system um, and uh, some minor changes to the water systems to, to help the cooling. We've uh been running the car since the 22nd of July and actually the runs that we uh, finished on Thursday and Friday were the 48th and 49th runs of the car and in making all of those runs and those uh, over that period of time we've basically used up the life of the engines so that was a planned um, situation uh, so we always intended to stand down the car for a few days between Speed Week and our own record attempts um, starting tomorrow and we've changed the engines, we've dismantled uh, many of the systems on the car, cleaned the car, checked everything. It's more or less like doing a, a major service on the car and it's been put back together again today um, to be in best condition, peak condition for our first record attempt tomorrow morning. We've been on 600 horsepower so far and these give us another 100 horsepower. So you know that, that gives us another step in speed combined with the longer course that we can use uh, during it. Uh, the FIA record week, we've got 11, maybe 12 miles, whereas during uh, the, the speed week we had 7 to 8 miles. So that allows us, we're still accelerating as we go through the flying mile, so the longer the course, the faster we'll be. Clearly there'll be more torque and more power off the line. Uh, there's a much greater chance of actually spinning the wheels at some stage, and I have just a little couple of instances of that during speed week, where one of one or other end of the car would pick up and, and uh, slip momentarily. There's going to be a higher risk with more power, so I'm going to have to work hard to control that. We're going to be working the car harder, we're going to be working the cooling system harder, we're going to be working the tyres harder, but we're going to be going faster, which will make it all worthwhile. On the runway today, we'll be just proving the systems. We won't be going very quickly, probably less than 100 miles an hour. Uh, we've got a limited amount of, of room here. We don't want to risk the car. We'll be stopping on brakes and we'll be using parachutes. Uh, so it's, it's really a systems check. They've taken the most complicated diesel car in the world completely to pieces, put new engines, modified the oil system, modified the uh, cooling system, uh, stripped down and reassembled the uprights, put new brakes on. Uh, we had one tiny snag with a, uh, with a blown seal on reassembly. After that, it ran perfectly. We brought it out here on the runway run it four times, got it onto boost four times, and everything is working like it says in the textbook. We've got a massive chance tomorrow to, be, to, uh, to take the uh, FIA record. We only need to crack 235. This car is capable of putting something like 100 miles an hour on that record if we have a good day tomorrow. And we will then become uh, officially internationally recognized as the fastest diesel car in the world. Have we got a chance of doing that? Hell yes, we've got a really good chance. first run we thermally limited uh, the engines which is exactly what we expected to do we're protecting the engines we're trimming them back when they get hot um, the cooling system still has a lot of capacity so the engines were trimming themselves back to give us a little over 320 miles an hour through the mile uh, stopped at the far end the guys uh, performed a 40 minute turnaround in about 25 minutes which was just beautiful to watch it was, you know, it was an amazing team effort given it's the first time they've ever done this against the clock they haven't had time to practice this because they've just rebuilt the car uh, turned the car around, got it ready to go, it started cleanly, accelerated very cleanly all the way up through the gears, fifth gear at uh, around about 3,500 RPM through the, into the measured mile. Um, I actually forgot at that stage we were doing a record, having hit the, uh, the, the speed we were looking for, eased off and then dropped the exhaust brake and then suddenly thought, I'm supposed to hold it to the end of the mile. 
having having got to the end of the mile, we lost a couple of miles an hour. Oh, it's terrific. I mean, it really is, and it's terrific from Andy's point of view because that's his third world landscape record. That's uh, that's really something. But the team is terrific because uh, this car has been built in a very very short period of time. It's been developed in a very short period of time. Uh, the guys have been working continuously, it's sort of 18 hour days, I think for the last uh, two to three months, and uh, they've got a world record, isn't that absolutely wonderful? It shows that we uh, not only make diggers that do 20 miles an hour, that we can make a car that will do 328 miles an hour as well, with our engines in, of course. I feel absolutely amazing for the team. I mean, this, this team is a fantastic group of people, and uh, we've worked together for 18 months and in particularly in the last six weeks or so with incredible intensity and they deserve this. The calibration we're running today was about 600 horsepower on each engine. Uh, we can go anything up to 750 horsepower. So we just need, what we need to do now is check the, the cooling systems and so on that they'll be able to handle that as well. We'll do that this afternoon, look at the data. Uh, but if that's all good then we'll have to discuss with the vehicle team and agree a, a target for tomorrow. We didn't start until quite late. We had some problems with the track early on in the morning, um, so the temperature, ambient temperature, was rising quite high. So, um, you know, we could have maybe have gone quicker today if it had been a little bit cooler ambient temperature and also if the engines had been a bit cooler. I stood at the, uh, the flying mile on the way back and the car looked very, very stable. It was uh, absolutely serene running through there. Um, really no problem with the handling of the car, clearly. Um, I think we have some issues with the cooling system. Um, but the, the engines went on to thermal D-rate in the first run and we need to figure out uh, you know, what that means and make some adjustments to the cooling system. Well, that will allow us to stay on full power for longer. <laughs> So uh, there's a little bit of work to do today and we'll be back to the We're looking for around about 350 miles an hour and having got a, a, a 328 yesterday which was just a smidge under what we were aiming for, we were looking for around 330. That's the highest uh, flying mile we've had so far. We're now looking to push that up to the highest peak speed and sustain it both ways through the mile. 350 miles an hour also, uh, it's no coincidence, that's also the speed at which we were able to test the tyres to. Now we're clearly doing our own tyre development out here and uh, on a run-by-run -run basis the tyres are taken off and very carefully inspected. They're absolutely fine, they are taking the salt conditions a hell of a lot better than they took the rig conditions. So with extra time we could develop the tyres to a higher speed but that's not, uh, that's not something we can do in a short space of time out here. Tyres, as we expected, have become our big limitation. So we have this incredibly fast car. We won't actually be using full power, astonishingly. We'll be using 12, 1300 horsepower today of the 1500 available, and that will hopefully give us a comfortable 350 with me throttling back to control the speed. So it's gonna be an interesting run. I knew that we would be able to do the project. I didn't know we'd be able to do it this summer. That's the really honest answer. I thought we would learn a lot this summer. I thought we would uh, we would go get a long way towards uh, towards getting there. I didn't know we'd be able to do it. It's fantastic. I, in fact, I cried. <laughs> Brilliant. Wonderful. I mean, they've, they've, they've done an amazing job uh, working in an adver adversity quite frequently. It's a huge statement of just how good the JCB engines really are. But more importantly, British engineering and diesel power have both achieved something quite, quite amazing today. Yeah.